Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I'm going to be reviewing this book. That is Diaries, Diary of a Psychosis, How Public Health Disgraced Itself During COVID Mania. Uh, this is Tom Woods' latest book, and uh, if you're familiar at all with Tom Woods, he's a uh, he's a, an historian, academically speaking, as well as a sort of libertarian uh, message maker. Uh, he's been in the libertarian movement since the Ron Paul days, at the very least, um, and been very prominent uh, since then. And this is something like his 11th or 21st or 500th book or something like that. Um, and it is an absolutely excellent one. But before I get into that, I also want to mention that uh, I also have a bit of a story of my own uh, about the particular psychoses that I encountered during uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and that is going to be roughly the second half of the video. So you'll find the timestamps for that as well. So uh, if you're if you've already bought the book, if you're not really interested in my thoughts on the matter, feel free to skip ahead and just have a look at what I have to say about my experiences uh, with COVID mania. Um, if that isn't as interesting to you and you're just here for the book review, that'll be in the first half. So there we are. Um, so in any case, I, I will say right, right off the bat, my review of this book is going to be overwhelmingly positive. I cannot recommend this book highly enough. It is fantastic for what it is. Now, when I say for what it is, that is a bit of a tempering of expectations, and that does have to do with some of my perhaps minor criticisms I would have of the book. So this isn't going to be completely positive. But when I do start saying negative things about this, make sure to keep this in mind that I do think that this is a phenomenal book, and it almost couldn't be more historically important with respect to the moments uh, of the last few years that we all were dragged through. So... What well, this book is, how this is set up, uh, requires a bit of backstory. If you haven't followed Tom Woods at all, and if you follow me, you probably have, but in case you haven't for some reason, you should. Throughout the pandemic, uh, Tom does a daily newsletter. Every day, he sends out a newsletter, or at least I think Monday through Friday, he sends out a newsletter to, to his subscribers. And a lot of what he was talking about during the pandemic was obviously related to COVID, because it's the major thing to talk about, especially relating to tyranny in the state. And so throughout this period, Tom had a day by day by day accounting of what was going on and what our responses to it were. This is almost unique. Now, if you follow this channel for any length of time, you know that I've been live streaming throughout most of the pandemic and since. And so I have something like a at least week by week response to what's been going on, but it's not as targeted, it's not as methodical as what Tom has put together here, because that's most of what this book is. So this book is a collection of everything that he wrote about COVID during that time period with some interconnections and, uh, and annotations after the fact. Now, because of what this is, it is more or less a diary, as the title indicates. It goes through day by day by day by day by day. And because of that, it is absolutely relentless showing what it is that we knew, when we knew it, and the significance of what was being done by people in power at the time. And now you might think, right, that, that I remember, right? I remember what happened. I don't need a reminder. It's just going to be more traumatic. And while I can't deny that, this is not a pleasant read, except maybe for, for a sort of vindication um, that we were right all along and we knew all along. Being reminded all of this is not always pleasant, so it isn't a very pleasant book to read, but I guarantee you, like me, there were a lot of things that you don't remember quite as well as you thought you did, because as Tom goes through day by day, or at least week by week, or every few days, going through exactly what happened, going through exactly what was done, going through exactly how we were reacting to it and responding to it, and then linking things together... There are a lot of things that happened, and there are a lot of things that we knew much earlier than I thought we did. Right? Even just right near the beginning of the book, it, in his section on spring of 2020, we were already, by April, we already knew things about the pandemic, about the virus, that I didn't remember learning until much, much later. For example, we knew we had the data already about uh, about the inefficaciousness of lockdowns. 
And he was already pointing to studies with the studies about that. He was pointing them out and sending them to readers and sending them to, to his followers, uh, to, to his subscribers and whatnot already in April of 2020, less than a month into the pandemic, barely four weeks to slow the spread. And we already knew that these lockdowns were, were inefficacious and we had the data to back it up. We had the arguments to back it up and we already knew it. We already knew the age discrepancies, right? We knew the extreme age discrepancies of the virus by late March, less than two weeks. And because of that, we knew that targeted protection would have been, uh, would have been more, more effective than total lockdowns. We, we knew all of this way earlier than I remember. And probably there are some things that happened in a different way or at a different time, even than you remember. Uh, Jay Bhattacharya, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, has a foreword to this book, and he actually lines up this point very well. Uh, he explains that there's a lot about the pandemic that we probably don't remember as well as we think we do. And I, I, I want to read part of his introduction here. I'll leave, I'll leave a lot of it for the book because you sh really should get it. But I want to read a little bit of this introduction to sort of give us an idea uh, of the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Because Dr. Bhattacharya gets it absolutely right. He says right from the beginning, memory is a funny thing. Reminds suppress our past traumas and difficulties because they are sometimes too difficult to bear unfiltered. But it's not that we simply forget them. Instead, we replace them with an ersatz recollections that soften the edges of the hard times. Our minds infuse those times instead with a patina of destiny or purpose that gives meaning to them that was often not present at the time we were going through them. It is for this reason that the pandemic diary that you hold in your hand is so important. The trauma of the pandemic years demands crystal clear recollection. And that is, I think, the biggest strength of this book is because everything is dated and because everything is in real time, everything is, is published and recreated from exactly when it was written and when it was happening, we can all remember our own perspectives, right? Maybe it wasn't our perspective yet. Maybe we came to these realizations later than we would have liked. This was the right perspective, and it was the right perspective right from the beginning. And we knew it was the right perspective right from the beginning. And remembering that, and remembering just how it went, is going to be absolutely crucial in the face of the regime, whatever. Trying to write history in its own favor. Trying to change the facts of the matter after the fact. Trying to say, well, we couldn't have known that it, that it was... Uh, that the, these policies wouldn't work, or we couldn't have known certain things about the virus, about how it spread. Well, all of this, right? We we know, and Tom shows us that we knew at the time that it was nonsense, and that is an absolutely crucial reminder. And so I will say about this book that this is first of all a good read; it's worth reading. But I think the value of this book is only going to increase with time. Because of how it's written, this will be far more of an historian's resource, even long into the future. Simply because this documents, uh, in, a, in again, an almost day-by-day -day manner, everything that happened, or a lot of what happened throughout the pandemic, and a lot of what we were saying about it at the time, and that is something that cannot be discounted. That is, that is crucially important that we have this historical record. And so I will say, I, first of all, I'm going to be reading this book again in a few years. Maybe even next year. I don't know. And it will be just as important to read then. So even if you don't get it now, now when this is being recorded, late February of 2024, nearly four years after the pandemic started, even if you don't see this video or come across a review of this book, or if you decide not to buy it until eight years after the pandemic, 10 years after the pandemic, 20 years after the pandemic, no matter when you have the opportunity, this book will be important. It'll absolutely be worth buying. It'll absolutely be worth reading. And it'll absolutely be worth rereading so that we can remember what was done to us and what we knew at the time. Now, I want to temper this, temper this enthusiastic support with a little bit of criticism. And some of this, I think, is, uh, is, is simply a trade-off, right? I think that 
the problem with this book, if there is a problem with it, is that it is entirely presentist. It is entirely from the perspective of when it was written with very little interconnectivity and annotation. There is some where for some in some cases when he makes predictions, he'll uh, he will note that it was fulfilled on this date and then see that date's newsletter, etc, that sort of thing. Those are there. Those connections exist. But they're but they're relatively sparse, and it's not as uh, it doesn't doesn't possess nearly as much sort of retrospective commentary from our perspective now as I might like. Right, and I will say Tom is fantastic at that sort of thing, and he was fantastic about it throughout the pandemic. But I would have liked to see more interconnectivity, um, references forward and backward, more than we got, uh, more than we got in the book. Now, I don't exactly know why he decided to do this. To do this. It, it, it may have been, thinically speaking, it may have been simply because uh, that would have been an exorbitant, uh, an exorbitantly more uh, amount of work uh, to annotate through everything carefully and link everything together. Um, but more realistically, it also perfectly well could be that doing so would shock us out of the perspective of the time. Because a large part of this is, as I said, a reminder of what happened then, in the moment. And adding our sort of post hoc historical perspective to that might have changed the tone too much. And so while, while it would have been good to have more retrospective analysis, I think, that also would have come with trade-offs. And so, again, I, I cannot recommend this book highly enough. It is phenomenal. It is absolutely worth reading now and later. Just know what you're getting and know what you're getting into. That this is a phenomenal response to anyone who is uh, who is in the least bit support of the COVID regime. But also that it is purely historical. It's not really analytical. It's not analyzing from our own present perspective because that's not the purpose of the book, right? So again, know what you're looking at. And with that expectation, Absolutely get it. Absolutely read it. It comes with my wholehearted endorsement. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit as well about my own experience, at least one of my own experiences from during the pandemic, when I encountered some of this COVID mania, when the public health establishment and other institutional establishments really disgraced themselves uh, in a way that is very much like what we read here in the book. Um... And this, uh, this is, this has to do with my own, uh, my own, my own university teaching. Uh, this, this is uh, something that happened at, at St. Leo University where I teach, which, uh, which don't get me wrong, it's an excellent institution, but it shows, the story that I'm about to recount shows just how deep the insanity got, that it reached this far into an otherwise upright institution that should never have happened. And this should never have occurred. There was no excuse uh, for for what was going on here, for for the for what I'm going to talk about. So again, I don't want to I don't want to give the impression that I'm disparaging my university in particular uh, or anything like that. An important thing to remember about this entire pandemic, and it's something that that Tom points out consistently through here, is that it was so easy to simply fall in line. It was so easy to go along with the narrative. It was so hard to say no. This is quite relevant to another talk that I've uh, talked that I've done in class about uh, about things like the Milgram experiments and our own capacity to go along with evil, even if we ought to know better. And so again, this isn't to this isn't to dis to specifically disparage the people specific particularly involved with this, but it woke me up to a degree to the possibility of otherwise trustworthy institutions failing and failing in ways that they absolutely ought to have known better. So this was in uh, February of 2022. So this was early in the fall semester, two years into the pandemic. And there, uh, this was, again, Remembering what was going on at the time, this was just about when a lot of the institutional structures 
the pandemic institutional structures, things like uh, vaccine requirements, things like vaccine passports, things like travel restrictions, things like um, social distancing, things like mask requirements, were starting to slowly fall apart just about everywhere. Very slowly, but it was happening. But this was uh, an exchange I had about, uh, about my university's mask requirements. So masks were going to be required in the classroom for the duration of the fall semester of 2022, which, again, we know in retrospect is completely silly and completely absurd, uh, contrary to all scientific evidence uh, that has to do with the matter, uh, as well as tremendously counterproductive uh, to, uh, to education, to the purposes that the classroom is there for. Now, we know this now. We should have known it then, we could have known it then, and we had every reason to know it then. However, a lot of our institutions were not on board with that. And so, so like I said, I think Leo had decided that they would still be having a, uh, and would actually be taking rather seriously, a mask mandate uh, for the fall semester of 2022. And so I, have, I had an email exchange with, uh, with one of the members of the, uh, of the board who is responsible for making COVID decision -making decisions and policies and all of that. Um, and if you don't mind, <laughs> um, I'd like to read through and comment on some of our email exchange because some of it was very enlightening as to the process that was involved here. Uh, so I'm uh, forgive my eye lines if I'm you know, looking off to the side and whatnot, I'm going to be uh, doing a bit of a reading. Let's see. Here we go. All right. Um, so this was a uh, this was a conversation with uh, with a uh, high level administrator at St. Leo. I'm not going to use his name um, just again out of professional courtesy. I don't want to specifically malign uh, malign this guy, but know that this is the sort of nature of these institutional structures. That this is the sort of thing that is that is entirely common. And so this is after I had uh, I'd asked my um, uh, one of, I don't recall exactly who, uh, what his position of authority is, but a, um, but a, a, a sub dean or some such about uh, about the policies and if there was some kind of um, some kind of rationale to them because we had all received a notice um, as to uh, what the updated policies would be in uh, in this sort of stage of the pandemic. Um, which, if you actually want to read that policy document, which has uh, all the information that was given, uh, if you want to read that policy document, I will put a link to it. It is still available online, and I'll put it. I'll put a link to it. And I'll put an archive link to it as well, just in case. Um, I'll put that in the description. Uh, and this is the 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 um, stage four framework uh, for this academic year for the uh, fall. Oh, sorry, fall twenty one, spring twenty twenty two. I've been saying fall twenty twenty two, spring semester twenty twenty two. And so apparently this email was forwarded uh, to uh, to one of the administrators, um, an associate vice president for academic affairs with a doctor of business administration. So, you know, if you're in academia, you know precisely the type of person I'm talking about. A cog in the machine, essentially, uh, of that upper level administration. And so he says... Hello, Mr. McCoy. I received a copy of your email regarding mask requirements. Please be advised that masks are required in classrooms. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you. Um, so I did, naturally. I said, I'm aware of the ongoing policy, which is what led to my original questions. I would greatly appreciate more detailed scientific and philosophical rationale for the policy, however, as outlined in the previous email that you received. So this being the one that he was forwarded. So I had already asked, like I said, I'd already asked somebody who was sort of institutionally closer to me. Um, if there was some, any kind of rationale and if, if there was any kind of guidelines as to why these particular uh, policies had been decided upon. So that is my goal. That is my goal throughout this entire exchange. Uh, keep in mind, so, um, that this, this exchange lasts for um, a couple of weeks, goes back and forth. Uh, so he responds, uh, did you get an opportunity to read stage four of the St. Leo COVID, COVID guidelines? Please review the document, and if you have any questions, you can give me a call tomorrow. Uh, and then he provides his phone number. Uh, I said, per my earlier email, I read the document in full, uh, which is what gave rise to my questions about the rationale for the policy. As I said before, there is no clear scientific or philosophical rationale presented in the stage four guidelines document that I can find. And pause my pause my note, my reading. If you actually go, if you actually go to it and read it, there is in fact nothing. There is no uh, there's no documentation as to why these policies are in place, what good these policies are meant to do specifically, um, what data they are relying upon, 
or even what um, what benchmarks we would have to reach for the policy to substantially change. None of that was present. So continuing, that I say, that's why I reached out in the first place, both for my own sake to understand the reasoning and research behind the decisions being made and to answer questions that will inevitably arise, especially given that my class is currently working through a module on logic and critical thinking. Thank you for your time, Vincent. Um, I, and this is actually true, I did wind up getting some various questions about this, both in the logic section of the course and then later on uh, in some various sections where we were talking about, um, uh, various sections when we were talking about uh, practical decision making, that sort of thing, because I was teaching philosophy of religion at the time, and uh, when we were reading Pascal and discussing pragmatism, uh, decision making, and uh, risk reward analysis, some of this came up, and I had no answers for my students other than that there were no answers. Um, so then I followed up with another email because uh, it had been uh, it had been a few days, uh, basically requesting for another uh, requesting again. Um, he gave a good reason. He had he had family issues. Um, saying that he was he was away and couldn't respond, um, and then gave me his again gave me a phone number to contact him. So I said uh, thank you for your swift reply. Unfortunately, I'm in class throughout most of the day tomorrow, and and here's the important thing. But I prefer to discuss matters like this, which require extensive citation and methodical analysis in writing anyway, so I can take the time needed to carefully examine the data under consideration. Any such research, especially what was used by whoever was responsible for deciding on the policies, would be greatly appreciated. Thank you again. Why I do this, and this is crucial, and if you if you are looking for any information like this, this is absolutely essential to this is in part, as I said, because it is just tremendously useful to have the time to carefully examine information before moving forward with the conversation. And this is why academic conversations are best carried out in writing like this, but it's also for documentation purposes. I was trying very hard to find any kind of real documentation, any real rationale behind these policies as to why these were being implemented in the way that they were. And I was again hoping to get some kind of documentation uh, so that I could, I could present it to students, so I could discuss it. Um, or even again, write on it. I was considering writing, uh, you know, publishing on this topic because it's. I wanted to know what the process was, and so he responds to this, saying, "I believe I made a typo in my phone number," and then correcting it. So I waited a couple more days to see if he was going to follow up on this, and of course he did not. I said hello again. Perhaps it hasn't been clear what I've been asking for. I would like to see and review for my own academic and educational interest any documents, data, research, and or arguments that have been referenced or prepared by those who have made the decision about the policies laid out in the stage four document. I was initially under the impression that there existed some published res uh, results available in some form representing the results of the arguments and analyses which gave rise to these policies. Am I incorrect in that assumption? If so, and the re results have not been published, is there a working document that I can access? An annotated bibliography, even? Any information you have would be helpful to me. But if you can't, can you at least please direct me to someone who does have such information available to them? Thank you once more. And I think here I'm being pretty courteous and considerate, given the fact that I've been blackballed for this entire period and I'd gotten basically nothing. So he responds, Stage 4 is the published document, which is online. No other document exists but this one. I am a member of the COVID team who developed the policies for each stage. We review the CDC, State of Florida COVID data results daily, and decide on what steps are needed at that time. In addition, St. Leo tracks its own COVID results for campus and centers, in other words, other educational institutions associated with the university, and make decisions based on those results. Okay, so based on those results, essentially the answer I'm trying to get is based on those results, how? Uh, what is the actual rationale behind how he gets from data, which he is not sharing, to a particular policy. Again, if the policy is based upon the data, you can give rationale for it, especially if he is responsible, or at least partially responsible for the decision making. Again, this all seems relatively straightforward, right? But again, this seems to be saying that there is, in fact, no rationale, no documentation, 
nothing as to why this policy is implemented in the way that it is. So I, can, I responded back. As I said, I've read the document in detail, and there was no rationale or justification presented therein, which is why I originally reached out with questions. You say you have data available and reasoning behind the choices being made. Can you give me that information and ideally a summary of how that information led to the decision? And he responded, uh, we review the data daily and do not keep it since it changes each day. And I responded again, in that case, can you provide clear conditions which led to the specific decisions outlined in phase four and what changes would give rise to policy changes? Certainly there were changes in the data that led to changes in policy. And you can specify what those were and what further changes will lead to further policy changes. Again, this is a reasonable thing to ask. If the policies are based on the data, and when the data changes, the policy will presumably change, there ought to be some standards to, to arrive at that as to what those changes in the data would have to be that would lead to what changes in policy. Unfortunately, he responds, stage four is the only published document that is available for you to review. If you have any additional questions regarding stage four, please reach out to your department chair and associate chair. And so I re replied, oh, by the way, that was uh, three days later, he responded with this. And so I, uh, I replied that day, my department was not involved in the decision-making process and therefore has no more access to the process or materials than I do. You, on the other hand, presumably among others, were directly involved in the decision-making process. All I am asking for is a rational insight into that process. I am asking this as an academic colleague considering scientific, ethical, and pedagogical judgments, not as an employee considering policy. I do not mean to be hostile about this, but I cannot help but express my frustration at receiving no answers in the week and a half since I began asking what I thought were quite reasonable and straightforward questions. Rationale, qua necessary and sufficient conditions, or an annotated bibliography are simple enough to expect from my undergraduate students, and should be no trouble for a fellow academic professional such as yourself or our other colleagues responsible for these decisions. If you cannot or will not provide any of the answers I am seeking, please direct me to someone who can. If that is impossible, and there was no scientific, ethical, or pedagogical research that went into this decision, I would appreciate it if you were upfront about it. I cannot imagine that being the case at a Catholic institution of higher learnings like ours, so I would naturally prefer a real transparent answer. Thank you. And that is the last correspondence I got from him. He uh, did not receive another response from him. Uh, the only other response I'd got, uh, the only other correspondence I have uh, with with um, with this vice president is uh, is something completely unrelated about student concerns, that sort of thing. And so that was the end of this conversation. And so I have again from this from this exchange, I have to conclude the only reasonable conclusion is that the decisions were completely arbitrary and not on the basis of any scientific, any ethical, uh, or any pedagogical concerns, but rather based on looking at the data and doing what feels right, which bears out everything that we have heard about every institutional decision at the time and since. This tracks with how the CDC has been making decisions. Uh, this tracks with how the World Health Organization has been making decisions. This tracks with how most state governments have been making decisions. And I was disappointed to find out that this is how academics were making decisions. Now, Doctor of Business Administration is a bit of a far cry from a PhD. Fine, fine, but so am I. Um, so, um, it is still an academic position at an academic institution, and a Catholic institution at that. We should be dedicated to, a, to the pursuit of truth and the reliance on truth and this importance and significance of ethics in our decision making that is related to this institution. And that, unfortunately, I found was simply not present. And that was deeply troubling to me and has, has shaken my faith in the solidity of these sorts of institutions, universities in general. Uh, even even the best of our educational institutions, I I now have some serious concerns about it. And I, I have to say, bringing this back to the original topic, Dr. Thomas Woods is a credentialed academic with a uh, with a 
past career in academia as a as a professor but he left he left academia because he saw better things to do elsewhere and while i'm not taking that route at least not at the uh, not at the time not right now this is one of those experiences that make his choice awfully tempting They give, they give rise to some serious concerns about the, the stability and solidity of the institutions that we otherwise would, or at least would want to trust. And it, it speaks to the weaknesses of, of ourselves, of our institutions. Uh, and it's just, my story is just one of so very many. Um, I'll mention as well that, um, that Tom wrote a companion volume to this. Um, what is it called? Uh, I should look this up. I should know this offhand. Um, but the, uh, the companion volume to this, oh, called Collateral Damage, that's it, uh, is a uh, collection of stories from, uh, from his readers and from his listeners and from, from his community. Um, collateral Damage, victims of the lockdown regime tell their stories. It's stories that are like mine, but mostly far, far worse. And that's a companion volume. It's, it's available for free online. You can, you can get a PDF of it. Uh, again, the link to buy this book and to get the companion volume will also be in the description because, I, like I said, I cannot recommend it highly enough. There have been lots of stories like this, but far, far worse. And if, if there's one thing that I can say that this, uh, that this pandemic has done, it is, it is that it has given those of us who are willing to pay attention a very solid and realistic idea of what the world is like around us, what our institutions are really doing and really capable of. It's a bleak look, but it's one that we have to keep in mind. And I think that this book is absolutely essential to keeping that in mind. So that's my story, and that's my review. Once again, I cannot recommend this book highly enough. Absolutely excellent, really well done, excellently put together. It is also huge because this this goes all the way through 2023. This goes all the way through partway through last year, to the end of last year, actually, I think. Um, partway through last year, spring of 2023. So it covers the basically the full pandemic for three full years of what happened. And it goes through it in such detail, and it's absolutely worth remembering. So even if you don't want to read it now, I understand it's still rather close to us emotionally. Buy it next year. Buy it for somebody else now. Buy it for somebody else next year. This is absolutely, despite being very historically focused, it is all about a particular period of time. This book will remain significant and it will remain important for years. Maybe forever, maybe as long as our civilization lasts, this will be a very important reminder of what we went through in this incredibly significant and tumultuous time. So, that's all I have for you. Thanks for listening. Go buy the book. I've been Professor McCoy. See you next time.